Hello everyone and welcome to the use of models in landscape ecology. I'm Liz Ferguson and I'll be taking you through an overview of landscape context, neutral models, and population models. So to start with, we need to understand what the context or landscape context refers to. It's essentially referring to the influence of local conditions on an area of interest or a habitat patch. Uh, there are local effects, such as the properties of the patch that might be at play within a, within a particular region. And then the landscape effects of the context might include things such as the flow of nutrients, the spillovers, population spillovers, as well as connectivity among the sites. And it's important to note that we're we're kind of looking at uh, the relationship between the patch or the habitat of interest and the matrix, which is all those elements that are going to influence as well as 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 contribute to the the dynamics of that region. So to start with, we can take a closer look into nutrient flow. And there's going to essentially be a proximity of source to sources of materials that can influence the patch properties. These can be negative influences or they can be positive influences. As an example, a negative influence might be pollution, whereas a food resource being located close to a habitat patch is going to be considered a positive, positive influence. Now, as an example of nitrogen, typically within a terrestrial environment, you have nitrogen that's present within the, the atmosphere. Uh, represented by that uh, two molecules of nitrogen gas. Um, however, that is that nitro atmospheric nitrogen needs to be converted to a form that that organisms can use. It's inert otherwise, um, so it has to go under undergo this process of fixi fixation, which can occur with the the help of de of nitrogen fixing bacteria as well as decomposers. Um, so. When you're, when you're looking at something like nitrogen in a cycle, there can be contributions to that nitrogen that can occur from natural contributions, from things like uh, lightning as well as nitrogen fixing bacteria and the process of decomposition, or there can be subtractions to it, such as leaching or the use of that nitrogen, as well as denitrification by, by things such as denitrifying bacteria. So there are natural elements that contribute to the movement of that particular resource within that, within that ecosystem. However, if we look at anthropogenic sources of nitrogen contribution, um, we find that something such as nitrogen deposition can occur. And in this figure here, you can see that there's some emission source. That emission source is going to either result in a dry deposition of, of nitrogen in the form of nitric acid, um, or it's going to result in wet deposition through rain. And some of the influences or impacts of this excess nitrogen that isn't kind of naturally shifting in and out of that system is a, a lower soil pH, which is quite dangerous for particularly for native organisms as they, they tend to have a, a tolerance. Uh, to specific pH levels, so range that they can tolerate. Uh, so that ultimately would lead to changes in the species composition. Uh, oddly enough, this tends to favor invasive organisms, which can have some devastating effects on native plants or animals. There's a loss of certain forms of fungi, and we end up finding this huge problem, especially in coastal waters and lakes and things, of eutrophication, where there's an amplification of nutrients in the water. Ultimately, this, this initially starts off as, as, a, as a boost in the production of certain, certain organisms, um, such as certain bacteria or certain protists, but ultimately that's going to result in a huge depletion of the oxygen within the region because of the fact that all those organisms don't have enough food to sustain them, they all die at the same time, and that decomposition is going to utilize a lot of a lot of oxygen within the environment. Um, so there's there's certainly some balances that can occur with these uh, with these different different nutrients within ecosystems. 
Um, it's the in this particular example where there's a proximity to pollution, there's going to be a, a disproportionate impact on some habitats or some patches versus others. So understanding um, the, 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 how they're connected and, and their spatial orientation is, is really important. We also take a look at population effects when trying to understand the context of a particular region. And a population size, and again, a population is a group of organisms of the same species that are found in the same location. Their size are, is going to be determined by, generally by birth, immigration, deaths, and emigration. And the surrounding landscape, however, can have a large influence on each of these elements. And we can take a look at a, an example in plants to kind of demonstrate how some of the interconnectedness or the context can influence influence this process of population size. Uh, so plants require, in order to increase their population, need to re require the, the ability to receive pollen from male gametes in order to set the seed and be able to fertil undergo fertilization and contribute to the population. Uh, that pollen needs to travel by wind or by animal vector from one flower, one plant to the next. Um, and in a study by Wagenius in 2006, um, they found that uh, population size of the flowering plants was, uh, which is indicated on the x-axis of the top graph, uh, was had a negative correlation to mean style persistence, which is the value represented on the y-axis. So the style persistence is really a measure of pollen limitation. Uh, the style is going to be an element, as you can see on the left-hand side, uh, there's a style which is a part of the female structures of a flower that are responsible for receiving that pollen. So the pollen limitation goes down as the local population size goes up. Um, in the bottom figure, we found that, that in looking at different isolation classes with distances, that the mean style persistence uh, was, had, a, had a positive correlation to that. So we've got isolation class along the x-axis and mean style persistence again along the y-axis. And as you can see across several years, the pollen limitation goes up as isolation, uh, isolation increases. So there really is a huge impact as on the pollen limitation within these plants, uh, given the fact that, that uh, the, the organism is going to need to have a larger style in order to, in order to um, be successful at reproducing and, and capturing some of that pollen. So pollination in general is really should be considered an ecosystem service within our communities. Pollinators are essential for wild plants and crops alike. Most fruits and nuts are wind pollinated, meaning that they are wholly reliant on natural process of wind carrying that pollen from one plant to the next, and about 70% of crops depend on pollinators in general. Uh, agricultural, agricultural practices typically do not support natural pollinators, uh, and non-native species are often used for this process. So it, there really is a huge issue with, in, as an example, uh, bee populations within the United States. And in this figure we have year along the x-axis and we have number of millions of co bee colonies along the y-axis and as you can see from about 2008 to 2018 there's been a significant decrease in the um, in the overall number of bee colonies that are present within the United States and in California we've had a significant continued significant loss of bee colony populations um, even more recently in between 2017 and 2019 um, so it's about approximately 19% loss between 2015 to 2017. And um, within the two subsequent years, there's been approximately a 3% loss, two and a half, a little more over 2.5% loss in the state's honeybee colony population. So this really has a huge negative impact uh, on the crops, as you can imagine, as well as wild, wild um, plants as well. So it's really... It, essential for us to maintain, critical to maintain these natural patches
uh, of native habitat intermixed between these agricultural regions in order to ensure that agricultural can, processes can continue as can you know, other things. Uh, the landscape position can also have an influence on the process of or the uh, ecology of an area. So the position in a watershed in particular will affect ecological processes. Uh, for example, there can be low inflow in some regions. The height above the water table can have a de can determine the water cycle within lakes or rivers. For instance, a, a higher lake that's above the water table will contain more water but have a lower concentration of minerals, whereas a lower lake that's located below that water table uh, can consist of less water but higher concentration of minerals. So in this particular example, that can have a significant impact on, on species richness as well. And in this figure, we see that there are landscape positions from high to low along the x-axis, and number of species along the y-axis. And as you get into those lower, those, re, those lakes that are in lower um, landscape positions, uh, you find that this particular study found that there is a higher number of species. So perhaps the contribution of those greater number of nutrients and, and minerals is significant or important for uh, various fish species to inhabit certain waters. Distribution of habitat versus species is another important thing to understand. A landscape position can influence the species distribution, as often the species exhibit habitat preference and may not change within the habitat with their respect to their habitat extent because of either some homing sense, they either have to go back to a certain area to reproduce, or because of dispersal limitations, which is where there's an inability to move to a better habitat. So if they're used to a certain habitat, then it can be certain, certainly challenging for them to, to make that change and shift to a new one. And in a study by Halstead et al. in 2013, who looked at gardener, giant garter snakes, um, in this particular map you can see the current and historic range in the, represented in the red of these particular fish that are quite reliant, or historically were quite reliant on wetland regions. Um, the yellow is representing the historical range. And interestingly enough, there is, after, despite the fact that there's been a drastic re reduction in the amount of watersheds and wetland regions within that, that area of Central California, uh, this study found that uh, the effect of, of distance to freshwater marsh was uh, greatly influential on the probability of currents of these of these particular snakes. Um, so it's interesting how, despite the fact that there's cha drastic change in the habitat, these snakes still decide to stay within the same relative range that they've historically occupied. Another thing that's important to understand is the concept of neutral models. Neutral models, landscape models, provide null models of landscape structure as a baseline for comparison with real landscape patterns, or are used for evaluating the effects of landscape structure on ecological processes. They are important because understanding the contribution of an environmental factor may be approached by this concept of constrained complexity, which is where you increasingly add factors to a scenario until a phenomena is reproduced or explained. And we oftentimes use simulations, um, varying degrees of complexity in simulations for these neutral landscape models. Uh, they, landscape can, the landscape can be influenced by cover type and other factors, as we're well aware. Uh, neutral landscape models, then, are simulations of the landscape with only two or more cover types present. So this only is going to include elements of the composition, or the relative abundance of each cover type, and configuration, or the patterning, arrangement, size, and shape of the patch. And in this particular figure to the right, you can see that there's um, various ways in which you can, you can kind of construct or work with the composition and configuration. So as a means of looking at some constrained complexity approaches, 
uh, we have a few different things that we can focus in on. First is pattern formation. And for this, we use a simple random model. Um, in this particular simple random model, each of the pixels in the, in the figure to the left and on the top set of figures, we have only one cover type or one class of vegetation. On the bottom, we have multiple classes of vegetation. But each pixel is just going to be random, randomly assigned to a cover type. In the top one, it will be presence absence, as opposed to the bottom, which will have an assignment to a specific cover type. Um, and it only addresses the composition. It doesn't deal with, in the simple model, doesn't deal with the configuration. In a neutral, in a, sorry, hierarchical or curdled ran random landscape model, uh, the hierarchical structure leads to greater clumping and a more realistic map. Uh, and it's not going to be tied to any kind of process. So in this particular example, there are certain larger, larger blocks or larger sections of the map um, that are going to be assigned to a specific uh, cover type. From there, the complexity in these models increases to include fractal landscapes. This is an even greater level of complexity, as you can see by the figure there. And essentially, there will be a, the uh, researcher will select a starting point and a random distance and direction from that first point. It's then going to go from there and shift around with respect to how it how it's going to generate and assign pixels within the within the uh, raster file there. This is going to mimic the spread of an organism, and it's a little bit more realistic of a pattern. Again, not including anything other than a composition and, um, and uh, yeah, there's no environmental influence happening within this particular model. Percolation or connectivity is going to refer to the physical connection of the focal cover type across the landscape for a given neighborhood rule. So it's just another means of generating these simulations. And the neighborhood rule is really just looking at how the connection is defined. So for instance, in this particular example, you can see that the for neighbor will state or, or inform the model that it should just assign the, or have the pixels share a side with another cover type. Um, the eight neighbor is going to indicate that they should share a corner, and the 12 neighbor will be equivalent to the eight neighbor plus, plus four additional pixels surrounding it. Um, so you can see in this that the percolating cluster or patch, is useful as a simple measure of connectedness within understanding that connectedness within a model. So when you work with these neutral models, there's going the agreement between the neutral and the real model is really not the goal, and, and there's no necessary truth that's occurring. So if you take, you try and model a region, uh, because these are really good for for a first kind of fundamental pilot study or understanding of your region and trying to model what you expect to see. Uh, but the, the real model most often will not reflect what the neutral model reports. But you're not looking for that to be the neutral model to be true. true. What you are looking for are some results that can provide information regardless regarding the contribution and regardless of some of these environmental processes. Um, so you're looking to see how that composition is, is kind of contributing and the, and the um, configuration is contributing to these particular processes. Finally, we can focus on population models. And a population model will provide uh, a method of evaluating if landscape heterogeneity has an effect on population structure the habitat they occupy, a population occupies, or the distribution of that population. And historically, we're familiar with these very simple exponential and logistic growth models that are really just looking at growth rate and not particularly looking at some of these other environmental factors, such as in the little brown image there, that might be resu resulting in some changes in that population. So one group of models that we can look at are metapopulation models. 
as, as you might recall from previous lectures, we talked about a metapopulation being a subpopulation of a, of a larger population. And they're essentially designed to look at and understand the patchy, patchiness that's associated with populations and how organisms get separated into different habitat patches. So if we take a look at this, we have highly isolated uh, patches and mostly small patches along the bottom left. And that increases in the connectivity between the patches along the x-axis to the right. And then also the uh, variability in the patch size, as wherein highly variable patch sizes are indicated on the y-axis at the top. So we've got a variety of different different patch dynamics that can occur and that can have an influence on the population size. And those metapopulations are going to be relatively, you know, important for understanding how organisms move from one patch to the next. There are historical models by Levins and Hansky, which represent the incident or the occurrence of an organism and, the, and, and factor in a colonization or extinction rate. And we can take a look at these, this, these simple concepts or these simple models by viewing how these different differences in the patch size uh, or the habitat distribution, such as over to the right-hand side with squares A, B, and C, can have an influence on the rate of colonization or extinction. So as you can see, the same or the same total habitat as well as smaller patches can result in larger colonization rates and, and relatively moderate levels of extinction um, as compared to panel A, where there's going to be the same patch size but fewer patches, and uh, in panel C, where there's going to be fewer patches and smaller patches. So there's certainly a, a relationship that exists between these patch sizes and the colonization or extinction rate, which largely these models can look at with metapopulations, but essentially what they're useful in informing folks of are, uh, or ecologists of, are the whether a habitat patch is representative of a source. So through the process of emigration, it's going to fuel more organisms into the sink patches, which is where there's not going to be new contributions sent to the source patches. So the source patches or the sink patches would essentially result in extinction of those populations or metapopulations um, had not there been this emigration occurring with the source patches. So these models really just help us in a basic understanding of the, the patch structure as well as um, the metapopulations or the subpopulations within those patches and how they're contributing to the overall population. Finally, we can take a look at an overview of spatial models, which is where distribution patterns are included in the modeling process. There's complexity that's involved in adding a location or a distance to a particular model. Um, and that spatial pattern is expected to influence the ecological processes as well. There's going to be causes and changes in the spatial patterns that are areas of interest to ecologists. So these, for that reason, tend to be quite popular. In this particular fact, figure here, you can see that uh, we, there's, a, there's a strong relationship between the environmental factors that are that are represented on the left-hand side of this figure, such as fine scale effects all the way up through large scale gradients of texture and soil carbon that ecologists will look at um, and also inform with things such as reproduction, mortality, uh, dispersion, predation, things like that. So this combination of fine scale and large scale element environmental factors as well as very, very various population processes are really kind of key to these spatial models. As an example of voles in Western Finland, um, and just as a note here, populations are in, oftentimes influenced by dispersal to a nearby patch, predator search behavior, disease, and tend to be spatially autocorrelated in their environment to nearby abiotic gradients and other elements. So in this particular study, they took a look at different four different agricultural fields, 
uh, wherein they had a control group um, and two other two other fields where they looked at uh, mustelid predators as well as avian predators. And they took a look at the population growth rates within each plot as well as correlations in growth rate measured among the fields. And what they found in the figure to the right-hand side is that there is a strong effect of the season, so strong seasonality that occurs with the vol densities. So we have month along the x-axis and we have uh, vol density along the y-axis. Uh, you could see that with the mustelid and avian predators present, there was a really significant significant increase in certain in in the uh, fall late summer and fall periods of time whereas uh, there was a decrease in those densities during the the spring and winter uh, we didn't see that in the control region it was a relatively even distribution or I'm sorry density of the voles across most seasons and actually had a even lower density during those months where it was higher in the other regions. There's also a strong effect of predators, as you can imagine. So in this particular figure, we have the different treatments with the control over on the left-hand side um, and the uh, mustelid and avian uh, being the next two data points there. And then the correlation effect, or coefficient, sorry, um, tended to be quite strong when there were those predators present, whereas the correlation of the mole to predators within the control was quite low. Spatial model characteristics include the fact that they are mathematically simple yet computationally intensive. You can use GIS, which is great, and simulate animal use of habitat, and animals can be represented at different levels of resolution, and uh, densities can be represented by a raster, as in the figure to the bottom right here with the rough-toothed dolphin. So we have quite a few benefits to using these spatial models, and they can serve a, a really strong, power, be a strong and powerful tool for understanding populations and metapopulations. I hope you enjoyed this presentation.